Okay, hello, hello. I'm Rasmus. I'm the voice behind the camera. We are live from Tartu College and thus we are accessible to all the 4 billion internet users. On behalf of Vemo, the Museum of Estonians Abroad, I'd like to welcome you to this online lecture. We would like to thank our co-organizers, the Finnish Studies Program at the University of Toronto and SWIA Toronto. Today we are glad to bring you a lecture by John Dovut Tolopsen, who is going to talk about the history of Estonian Swedes. If you have any questions, you can leave them into the chat on the right. You need to be logged on to your Google account for that, or you can email us. I will put the email address to the chat as well. And yeah, so without further ado, Trond, please, the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I want to say a little bit of I'm sorry for the delay. As for with everyone, uh, the current corona crisis has uh, created some challenges uh, and that led to a delay here. Luckily, it's quite easy to do uh, an online talk like this at a different time. So I'm glad we could manage to, to push it for, for another week like we have. My talk is called Liberation or Salvation, the Omse Estonian Swedes between the Swedish Evangelism and Russian Orthodoxy, 1873 to 1887. In actuality, it's going to be a little bit broader and at the same time a little bit narrower, as we shall see when I get to the structure of the talk. There is a reason for that, uh, uh, which has to do with the format, basically in that we don't want to torture you with a two hour long uh, uh, talk here. So I'm trying to hit the core points and give you some nice pictures to show, give you examples of what I'm talking about during this uh, lecture. First, on the structure of this talk, I'll start with giving a historical background, historical background on the Ormse Estonian Swedes. Um, then we get to the core period under discussion here, which is started when Omse peasants rode to, the, to Stockholm to talk to the Swedish king in 1861 to protest against their landlord. And as a result, you get the arrival of Swedish missionary uh, a decade later. Then we will look at uh, some of the purported results of the Swedish missionaries' uh, mission to Omse. Uh, the destruction of rituals, of old-fashioned rituals uh, among the peasants. In this case, we'll focus on the wedding ri rituals as an example of lost traditions lost due to them. Then we'll focus on uh, what we, uh, uh, me and my research team, uh, have been especially interested in, uh, the orthodox conversion request by uh, 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 about one-fourth of the peasants of the island as a reaction to the missionaries. We'll briefly mention the, the, the biggest findings from the archives so far. Then I'll conclude uh, the remarks, which should be hopefully within 30, 45 minutes from now. First, a little bit of about the project. Uh, the principal, principal investigator on this is not me, it's uh, Dr. James White, who's a research fellow at Tartu University. He's working on a bigger project at the moment, it's funded by the Estonian research authorities called Baltic Orthodoxy, which has its own uh, uh, website, uh, balticorthodoxy.com, where you can read about Russian state attempts and Russian Orthodox church attempts to, to make uh, Estonians and Latvians in the Baltic uh, region into Orthodox believers as a part of the Russification processes of the 1800s. When it comes to the Estonian Swedes, there is a uh, a lot on, of literature in Swedish on, on them, and as well as on the Swedish missionary efforts. There's almost nothing on the Orthodox conversion efforts, however. That's why uh, the project that we're working on now, but we're in the very much in the beginning phases of it, uh, is such an uh, interesting uh, new approach to it. Uh, James is exploring state and Orthodox church archives to tell uh, this part of the story of uh, Estonian Swedes. 
And in, in this way, we're hoping to see the Ormsø people and the Estonian Swedes in general as not only passive receivers of, of a Swedish civilizing mission, which is often how they're presented in the Swedish historical literature, but active agents navigating in a changing society. I also want to briefly mention that uh, there is not much English language literature on this. There is one excellent PhD thesis for anyone that's more interested in reading up more on it. Uh, by Glenn Eric Kranking, it's called Island People, and it's from 2009. And you can find it by uh, Googling, it should be available a PDF online. So let's first discuss uh, names. The Estonian Swedes did not refer to themselves, especially in this period, as Estonian Swedes. They referred to themselves as, I as the Aibo folk. Aibo well, means island dweller, in their Swedish dialect. Uh, they refer to their lands as Aiboland or Aiboland. And I will use the Swedish names for the areas, uh, for the islands in this presentation, uh, which you can see on the map here. Uh, I, will I will focus mostly on Oremsö, which you can see basically in the middle. It's the island with the blue and the red uh, together. Uh, and Nukke next to it. Nukke used to be an island and now it's a peninsula uh, north of Hapsalo. And on the extreme south you see the island of Rune, which will also be mentioned in this talk. Uh, I should probably go through quickly the try to s tell you the Estonian names of uh, the different places. Rune would be something like Rohnu. Is that correct? Yeah. Ormse, Vormsi. Narge, Naisar. Uh, Rogöarna would be the Pakri Islands. Nukke would be Noa Ruzi. And Odensholm, Osmosar. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so the Aibo uh, inhabitants, we don't necessarily know when they first started arriving. Uh, we do know from uh, Hapsa, Hapsa, some sources of from, from Hapsalo uh, that they were already living, at least on Ormsö uh, and some other areas, in 1294. There's a theory proposed by a Swedish archaeologist a few years back that uh, they actually arri arrived in 1206 in the beginning of the, of the Northern Crusades uh, when Estonia and uh, Latvia was forcibly Christianized by uh, the Danish and uh, by the Germans. Uh, they were a relatively uh, privileged group in the beginning. They lived under Swedish law. They were free farmers. Uh, but they started becoming uh, poorer from the period when the Swedes took over actually and started removing some of their rights. Uh, it was not the Swedish uh, um, majesty or the state that did it, it was the new landowners that got responsibility for their lands. And this process continued afterwards and got much stronger when the Russians took over after the Nordic Great Nordic War in the beginning of the 1700s. By the 1850s and 60s, when we start our story here, they were desperately poor coastal farmers. They all spoke Swedish dialects, uh, but we also know that all of them spoke at least Estonian. Probably a lot of them spoke also uh, some German, uh, maybe even some Russian. But they all spoke Estonian, uh, the Estonian language to the degree that they often spoke Estonian if if uh, Estonian Swedes or Aibo from different islands met each other, they couldn't necessarily understand each other's dialect, but they could Esto understand Estonian. We will focus mostly on Ormsö this time, or Vormsi, as, it's as I said it was called in Estonian. The life on the island was uh, harsh, as I said, during the period we're talking about here. They were free farmers, uh, so they were never 
uh, indentured servants like the Estonians were up to uh, 1812. But the obligations to the landlords, which controlled the land, uh, kept growing during this period. The women did most of the farm work. You can see some examples of that on the picture here. Uh, uh, While well, the men were out fishing or worked uh, on the Barents estate. All the farmers, all the farms on the island had to work uh, up to 150 work days per year for free for, uh, for the estate owner. And here too you see uh, a bunch of women that are herding the sheep on the island close to the main village of uh, Olmsø Hundo in the 30s. What the main, uh, the main social conflict on the island from uh, the time the, the landlords took over until uh, the period we're talking about here was definitely the constant struggle between uh, the peasant far the tenant farmers and the landlords. Uh, for most of the period under Russian rule, the land on Olmse was owned by the Stackelberg family, who, according to family legend, won the estate uh, in a game of, uh, of dice with a French count. That proved, to quickly, proved quickly to be uh, quite cruel and, uh, and violent rulers of the island. Uh, uh, I'll show you this picture, by the way, because Magnushof is where their estate was. That's uh, 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 what you see on the picture is basically ruins left uh, from, from, their, uh, from their estate building. Stackelberg were exceptionally cruel even by the very harsh standards of Estland at the time. Um, there was a Swedish skipper that visited the island in 1830. He visited not by choice. His ship had gone on ground uh, next to Ulmsö and he needed help to get back into the sea. And while he was there, he was taken under protection of, uh, of the father of the man we see here, Otto Friedrich. Uh, von Stackelberg. But he noted it down what happened because it was so shocking to him. Uh, they were driving in a sled in the, on the snow along the roads of the island and as we had full speed and he said he could see as they were traveling the, the, the farmers threw their carriages into the side of the road so, not, so they were not hit by the baron and then they threw themselves on the ground and touched their head to the the snow in respect to the baron. The baron in response started swearing and uh, spitting at them and started whipping some of them even uh, while he was driving past it at full speed. His behavior was so uh, disruptive to the social uh, uh, system at the time. There were so many complaints by the peasants to the provincial authorities and to the courts, that he actually lost control over the estate for 12 years, from, the from 1835 onwards. The Stuckelberg family only won back full control of the estate after he died and his son Otto Friedrich von Stuckelberg took over. And uh, it's Otto Friedrich von Stuckelberg that was ruler of the island in the period that will we mainly be dealing on uh, dealing with uh, during this talk. There was some support for the farmers' case within the provincial authorities and the courts while the father was alive. Uh, that was one of the reasons why it was taken over by the state. Uh, when the son took over, though, it seems to have been a decision to let him to not intervene too much. And he quickly started turning the screws again uh, on the farmers. They tried to go to the provincial authorities. They tried to take him to the court. Nothing helped. And then they came up with an old solution that had always been 
uh, part of the tradition of the Aibo people, but hadn't been done on OMSA for many, many years. Their traditional protector, protector had always been uh, the monarch of Sweden. So what they did was that they rode across the Baltic Sea to Stockholm in the summer of 1861. There they got off the boat, walked up to the royal castle and knocked on the door and asked for an audience. Remarkably, they immediately got an audience with him. He listened to their complaints and sent a letter to the Tsar. One of the reasons was that their arrival had started a media sensation in the Swedish capital. The Aibu people, the Estonian Swedes, had all but been forgotten by the Swedish uh, population at the time. So their rediscovery turn, turned into a massive media event that went on in the newspaper for weeks afterwards. One of the reasons for that was the strengthening sense of Swedish nationalism during the time. This was a period of, of, of uh, what we call nation building, of building all a new sense of what it was to be Swedish around nationalist terms. Among those were a certain view, nostalgia for the Swedish empire that had existed in the 17th century when the Swedes had controlled most of the Baltic, Northern Baltic Sea, uh, a longing for reuniting with Finland, where a Swedish minority was still the ruling class, both aristocratic and, and bourgeois ruling class of that society, even though it was under Russian control. And the Estonian Swedes, the Aibo, fitted into this uh, as an example of the Swedish roots uh, to the south of Finland too. And their story of, uh, of despair, of poverty under the barons was turned into a story about Russian uh, uh, cruelty and barbarism against a noble Swedish lost tribe. The fact that it was a uh, Baltic German landlord that was doing it was uh, lost in this, uh, in this media campaign. So while their trip was a success in Sweden, it turned out to not be such a much of a success when it came to changing conditions in Urmse. For the Russian state apparatus, it was obviously a somewhat surprising uh, to get a letter from the Swedish king about these people, and they immediately saw it as a threat, as, Swedish, uh, as the Swedish government meddling in their affairs in the border areas with Sweden. Uh, they immediately started repressing the farmers on Olimsa. They sent 300, uh, 300 uh, soldiers to the island, which at that time had like 2,000 pe people living on it. Each farm was supposed to, ha to have at least two soldiers living there uh, to be housed and fed for three years. The leader of the, the five that rode to Sweden had to house 30 soldiers. Three of the others were conscripted into the Russian army. That meant that they were supposed to be serving the Russian army for 25 years. That was the period of conscription at the time which meant that they would lose most of their working uh, life, working for uh, the Russian military, if they had survived at all. They chose to, to flee again and flee to Sweden with their, with their families. So the 1860s was a period of, of, of uh, increased repression for, for the Olmse Swedes, for the Olmse Aibo. Yeah. But they had the Swedish uh, Communities in Sweden had gotten aware of them. Also through, in academic circles, through a book by uh, a German Baltic academic called Rusforum about Aibo culture that had a lot of impact on, 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 on academic research and interest from that field on them. So. The end result of that was that uh, the 
Swedish Evangelical Homeland Society, as I call it, or Evangeliska Fosterlandsstiftelsen, uh, a Swedish inner mission society that also, uh, there's missionary society that all both helped uh, spread the Lord's word in Sweden, but also started sending out missionaries around the world, decided to send uh, two missionaries to to Estonia to help uh, the Aibo people. Their goal was officially to help set up schools because uh, uh, the school reforms in the Swedish air speaking areas were still in the uh, were still in their infancy. They hadn't set up all the schools like on Urmsa. There was only a, a Sunday school at the time, no regular school. Uh, on several other Swedish uh, islands, they didn't really have uh, teachers that were properly Swedish speakers uh, and so forth. So that was the official reason and why they were let into to, uh, to, to these areas by the Russian state was as uh, teachers. But in the documents they sent back with communication with the EFS and so forth, they saw themselves as missionaries. They were going to save the Swedish speakers they were going to, to find them to, to, uh, to, to civilize them, make their life better, teach them new ways to grow on the fields, to, uh, to help them uh, with reading and writing, uh, and so forth. It was uh, very much, uh, uh, very much the full package that you see uh, uh, missionary uh, uh, missions to the rest of the world too. To Ormsø, they would send a man called Lars Johan Österblom, which is uh, now that the most famous of the two missionaries that were sent first, in that he was gotten famous as per almost personally uh, rejuvenating society on Ormsø. Uh, to Nukke, uh, Noah Rotsi, uh, uh, the uh, Tore Emanuel Turen was sent. Uh, and he's maybe the one that had the most immediate success of the two. Uh, he started a school, a teaching college in Nukke, Nukke when he arrived. Uh, the goal, which he succeeded with, uh, was to teach a new uh, generation of Swedish-speaking uh, teachers for the public schools for the entire Swedish-speaking area. And he wanted locals to do it. And here you see the first class he has. A lot of these people became community leaders afterwards, uh, especially the little guy you see in the middle there, 14 year old at, at this time, Johan Nyman. Uh, became a, a leading personality, not only in uh, Nukko, where he would live and, and, and run the school, but also for the entire Aibo community. Uh, what he also did was to start the revival movement among the Aibo. Uh, at first, it's pretty clear what started it, because uh, we have yeah, uh, Newman's recollections about it. In the beginning, they couldn't even understand uh, Turian when he was speaking. He was speaking with uh, a relatively fancy uh, Stockholm dialect, which they couldn't understand. Uh, it took them uh, quite a long time to, to learn to understand it. But he did bring a lot of very beautiful psalms with him that he made them sing. He taught them how to read uh, notes and sing from, uh, uh, from them. And this created a, a sensation uh, on Nukko. Nukko. So. And uh, Österblom would follow that up in the years that followed on, uh, on uh, Olmsø itself. And while Turin's revival happened, it seemed almost by accident, Österblom was actually after this trying to convert him. Unfortunately, had more problems with that. Uh, part of that was his, he was put in a quite a 
it's quite difficult position compared to Turin. Turin had the support of uh, the local landlord, he had the support of the local pastor, Kirigenson, to start up the school. Uh, Österblom didn't get support from either the pastor or the, the, at the beginning from, uh, from Baron Stockelbeck. The pastor seemed to, to have been extremely skeptical of Österblom in the beginning and after having lived for a very short time in the pastor's uh, house, he had to leave. Uh, what he did, Österblom, was after a while that he decided if he was going to su uh, succeed on the island, he needed a powerful protector. And it had to be the pastor or the, or, or the landlord. They were the only ones available at the time. So he managed to get into the good graces of the baron by basically, he observed that whenever he started preaching to people, they tended to kind of find an excuse to run away. Uh, so uh, he decided to stop uh, the tea thievery of the, of the baron's supplies. Uh, the, the, uh, it, was a, it was an accepted thing among the Ormser peasants to steal from the baron. It was completely uh, forbidden to steal from each other, but from the baron they considered what he had as being stolen from them anyway, so they would find any, ex uh, any way to, to, to take back what they felt was rightfully theirs. So what he would do was to stand uh, to, uh, close to one of the storage areas and, and start preaching as soon as someone came to take something and they would immediately run away. Uh, this uh, was very popular with the Baron, who invited him to stay in, in the mansion, Baron's mansion, Magnusov. But that of course created some problems with the local uh, population too, who knows now saw him, saw Esteblom as a stooge for the Baron, as an ally of the Baron. And it took him years afterwards to build up some kind of trust with the peasants, which he did basically by holding school for the children and being uh, uh, quite nice to them. Uh, uh, so I think it took two or three years before he himself managed to get, gather people around uh, for uh, prayer meetings for song and, uh, and uh, psalm singing uh, and so forth. And uh, then the revival uh, movement took off on Ormsa too. When it first took off, it, it grew quite strong, stronger than on Nukka, uh, Nukka uh, basically. So I want to talk a little bit quickly about, wh well, what was the revival here? Uh, these people were already Lutheran, of course. Uh, uh, and I think we have to take into account what these uh, lay preachers were saying to them. Why was this revivalist movement such a strong force in these communities? Uh, and, and, and what did it really change? For that we have to think about uh, what was the conception with religion, with, uh, with, with the word of God, with, with salvation before these people came, and what did they preach to them? And to put it simply, we could say that before uh, Esteblom and Turian came, there was a conception of uh, salvation was something that you got in heaven. And you worked as hard as you could while you lived, tried to survive, and then you were judged at heaven's store after you were dead. What Esteblom and Turin uh, offered, on the other hand, was a, a certain amount of certainty that uh, by accepting Jesus in your heart now, you were already promised that you were saved. In this way, it was almost as if heaven had moved down to earth. These people knew that they were saved, now they only have to prove that it was right that they were saved through, through, through living the, uh, in a moral way, through showing the light to others, that could keep proving that they were already saved for salvation. And this led to a division within society between the ones that uh, uh, felt that way and that had that revival uh, and the ones that for some reason or other did not have uh, have that kind of, that re revival that awakening as they call it. 
So what you got out of it was a split society, but a very, very religiously uh, uh, awoken one, where everything revolved. It was a power dynamic that was changing on the island, and it was all revolving around, basically, uh, heaven and hell. For when it came to um, what the missionaries were sending back of information to Sweden, it looked a little bit different. There they talked about their mission on the island, very much in terms that sounds a bit like uh, what we call a civilizing mission. Huh? Uh, Österblom, for instance, focused a lot on, on, on the good impact his, he and his teaching and his uh, uh, preaching had on the lives, on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on, on the economic life, on the social life, on the moral life of the Oremso inhabitants. He, for instance, said that he had managed to stop drinking on the island line almost completely. Well, there was 13 bars there before he came. Now there was none. He had improved the clean cleanliness of the island. He noted that he, d he discovered early on that people were coughing and had bad, had, they could barely breathe properly, a lot of them, he said. And it, their houses were incredibly dirty and full of, uh, of soot. And he took that from, the, from coming from the fact that they didn't have chimneys on their houses. They had what we see here, a smoke house, where they were lighting a fire inside of the house and would go up to into the rafters, but there would be no way for the smoke to get out. Uh, this he managed to solve, he said, by making the inhabitants of the island install chimneys and to wash down everything and install flooring uh, and so forth. According to him, the most of the people on the island was illiterate, so his, school, his schools helped uh, uh, make everyone read and write. He managed to stop all the theft on the island, as we mentioned earlier, and there was a, a wholesale increase in the morality and in the hard and in the work ethics of the island. He said that well before the islanders had gone around. Uh, to the local areas and begged to the Estonians in filthy clothes. Now they were, uh, now they were um, sought after workers that were continuously asked for for extra work uh, in the in the communities around Odense. Uh, uh, a lot of these uh, claims have been criticized heavily by uh, by historians afterwards. Uh, uh, because a lot of them are not, th there seems to have been some, some, some bragging involved. For instance, the, the bar's closing happened, happened mostly before he came. There was only one place serving alcohol left when he came, and that was closed quickly after. And that had more to do with the fact that the baron was not allowed to produce and sell to the farmers any longer by state decree uh, at that point. Uh, when it came to the houses, uh, it was not really up to the to the villagers to install to install chimneys on the houses. That was the houses were owned by uh, by Baron Stackelberg, so it was up to him whether it was installed or not. When it comes to theft, uh, historical literature has actually talk about how among themselves there was an increase in theft during this period. It was after his arrival that people started putting locks on their own doors in their own storage areas. What stopped was stealing as much from the Baron as they had done before, uh, which turned out to be very profitable for the Baron. Uh, it said he increased his profits from the estate by about uh, one-fourth during the period because of the lack of graft and stealing, basically. But the harshest criticism against him, and then I'll be moved to the next topic of the, of the talk, was that he killed off the ancient traditions of the Oromse Aibo people, or even 
from a Swedish nationalist historic perspective was killing off the oldest traditions surviving from, from Sweden's past. And there is no doubt that the missionaries did discourage a lot of the old traditions on the islands, uh, especially uh, on Ulmsö. Österblom talked a lot about how, how the sinfulness of dancing, of drinking, of, uh, of non-religious singing and, and, and uh, music. Uh, on the other hand, probably see the decline of these kind of traditions uh, in, in, in rural areas all over Northern Europe at this, at this time anyway for, for different reasons that have to do with the, uh, modern, with the coming of modernity. On the picture we see a tradition that all the, uh, the Aibo people islands had when it came to, to weddings. Uh, this is from the beginning of the wedding where they would have a small carnival procession in the beginning before uh, two men would dress up as on most islands on an ox. Uh, on the island of Rune, which this picture is from, they would dress up as a goat and then they would be uh, symbolically butchered for the wedding feast uh, with, with a wooden sword. That's what's going on here. The reason why we have this picture from Rune is because they were not impacted to the degree of the other uh, Swedish uh, islands by, uh, by modernity, basically, and spe specifically not by, uh, by, by revivalist movements during this time. They kept to themselves, uh, basically. So a lot of the pictorial evidence, a lot of, uh, of, of the different traditions uh, have survived to a higher degree on Rune to the far south uh, in the Bay of Riga than on, in the other Estonian island cultures that we saw uh, on the earlier map. The wedding feasts were a massive thing, massive thing among the uh, Aibo people. It was one of the seminal events in their life, a communal event where everyone came. And here we see the, one, the poor uh, elderly relatives put outside because they were to join the feast. Uh, but there wasn't enough space for them inside where the singing and the da dancing was going on. And you see the young girl standing by the doorway, uh, by the window there. Uh, the, in this picture, it was the old people, old relatives, and it was also the photographer, the Swede. He was not all Ill allowed inside either. Uh, his place was between the two gentlemen in the front here. Uh, and this is the only... Well, uh, pictorial evidence we have of the Ormser wedding. Uh, it's from uh, Rusworm's book from 1855. It shows a dance inside of one of the uh, smoke uh, houses that we talked about. They covered everything in fabric to cover up all the soot and uh, stuff. And then you have uh, the musician playing a traditional uh, instrument uh, of the uh, Aibo people the Tal Harpa. A lot of, of evidence seems to point to this having been an instrument that was played all over the Nordic uh, countries during the Middle Ages and even before. There is uh, a statue from uh, the 1200s on the Cathedral of Nidaros of a man playing an instrument that looks almost exactly like this one, uh, meaning that it was played in mi middle Norway at the time. Uh, this is the last Talharpa made by an Aibo, uh, by Anders Vaxam. Uh, and it was a tradition that was uh, quickly dying out at this point. On Ormsö there were uh, there was, uh, descriptions of how they would during the fervors of uh, revivalist preachings, they would take them out, break them, and set them on fire. The bagpipe, the Estonian bagpipe, was seen as even more sinful than the Talharpa. Here we see, again, one of the last examples of, uh, of the instrument. This is uh, Adam Söderström on 
on the, from the island of Lilla Rogu, who's playing his instrument. Uh, now, b bagpipes were widely known and used all over Estonia during this time, but also dying out uh, quickly. Uh, first of all, again, because of revivalist movements that not only existed on the Aibo Islands, but also spread out to the rest of northwestern Estonia and then to the Estonia in total, it was seen as a sinful thing. Uh, in, as the revivalist fervor died down, uh, the, the accordion took over for a lot of the same uh, uh, purposes. When it comes to, especially with a bagpipe, you can see how it was, how the combination of song, dance, uh, music playing and drinking came together in the moral con condemnation of these older ways of entertaining oneself. On Nuke, they stopped playing the bagpipe already in the 1700s after the local priest, who they valued a lot, told them that it was the devil's instrument and it sounded like the winds of hell. So he definitely did not like the sound of it uh, and they took it in a very literal sense as this was uh, uh, the work of the devil and stopped playing it. On Ormse, they had a legend about the village of Busby on the southwestern uh, part of the island. Supposedly it was very rich, but uh, they liked to play the bagpipe. During a big wedding, they had uh, a feast that went on and on, and uh, the musician was playing by the seashore when a man from this giant man from the sea came and dragged them all into the deep again. They all disappeared. The only thing that was left afterwards was the musician dead, hanging from a barn door, uh, crucified on the barn door, and with a bagpipe under him. Uh, and from that moment on, they did not play the bagpipe any longer. Uh, <coughs> and when it comes to um, weddings, they were a giant thing. They lasted often for two, three days, uh, full of uh, feasting, of drinking, of merriness. merriness. Uh, they were obviously a target for revivalists uh, on a moral mission to, to come closer to God. Uh, and it's noted in Esterbaum's book too that uh, they, uh, the, the weddings uh, among the revivalists focused on, 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 on proper ethical behavior, on singing of psalms, and the avoidance of drink and dance. So when it comes to, to, to wedding rituals, at least, which we have a, which we had a brief glimpse at now, uh, they did have a, a large impact. A lot of the wedding rituals came back uh, again in modified form after the, the fervors of, uh, of the rivalist movement. Uh, but a lot of the traditions involved died forever. Uh, in some cases, it was a good reason for that. Uh, like the end, formal end of an Olmse wedding was supposedly uh, the bride setting out a chair for all the male guests. They sat down and she started delousing their hair, removing lice from their hair as the last uh, goodbye of the of of, uh, of the wedding. So, which is something obviously that would probably have died out as the general hygiene uh, got better uh, during this period. So. Now we go to the third and last part of this lecture, where we will go through uh, with the focus of uh, the research of Dr. James White and I are on, which is uh, the impact of the arrival of orthodoxy on the island of Ormse. First of all, uh, well this picture is of uh, the orthodox plan for the orthodox church that was uh, go that was built on the island after uh, after the uh, after s the conversion of, of many of the islanders uh, didn't look exactly like this uh, but uh, s s somewhat like it uh, why did they convert that is 
somewhat contentious, con contentious uh, question. Uh, there is no doubt that Österbom had split the, pe the, the farmers uh, through his uh, revivalist uh, teaching and his revivalist movement. Not everyone was happy with this, did not want to join it, and uh, his only opponent on the in the religious field of a more traditionalist religion that didn't interfere in every aspect of life to the same degree, was the Lutheran pastor, uh, Nurgren. Unfortunately, he was extremely unpopular among the, the farmers. He was prone to drink. Uh, he was not doing his duties, they felt. Uh, so he was not someone they could rely on as a, as a uh, pastoral shepherd for the ones that did not want to join the revivalist movement. Eventually, there seems to have been a, a consensus among the, uh, the ones that did not feel happy with the direction things were going vis-a-vis -vis the revivalist movement to reach out to the or Russian Orthodox Church to see if they could help. And they quickly responded in 1886 uh, and managed to convert. Uh, the numbers differ, uh, basically, depending on who you ask. Österblom claims around 200. The Orthodox Church documents claim 550. The number is probably somewhere in between. That would be between one-fourth and one-tenth of the population of uh, ones that converted to orthodoxy at this time. With them came a lot of changes. There was new orthodox uh, a new orthodox church, which we see the plan for here, and, and two orthodox schools that started up teaching uh, for the local children from an orthodox perspective. And what we found in, uh, in the archival material the about this uh, conversion effort uh, is basically th th two things we want to share with you now uh, as preliminary findings. First of all, uh, in all the literature that's written about it now, so far, which is not much, uh, it's mentioned that pre pressure came from, from the governor of Estland, Prince Sergei Shalkovsky, Shalkovskoy, uh, to convert uh, the local peasants. This seems to not be true. It was actually the Bishop Donat, uh, or, uh, the head of the Baltic uh, uh, Orthodox Church, that was pressuring uh, to do so. And one reason for that was probably another big surprise uh, that uh, Dr. James White found in archives. Uh, the conversion effort that had happened 20 years before on the island of Rune, uh, which as he said is uh, in the middle of the Gulf of Riga. This conversion effort is in 1866 uh, had led to the Baltic Orthodox Church already having a priest that could speak Swedish uh, called Urlov, and also this many of the of the of, of the songs and the rituals having been translated into Swedish uh, uh, at that time. So it wasn't that much extra effort for them uh, to set up uh, a church in Olmsu either. It would kind of pay off for the expenses that had been done 20 years earlier. The Rune conversion effort is, is, is a bit different. Uh, first of all, it was the entire island that wanted to convert. We can see uh, the community leaders and their signatures on this next document. It's all in, in, in uh, Cyrillic, so they put their what you can assume is their farm symbol or their family symbol next to it, which looks like runes there. <coughs> so it seems, based on, on the source material that we found there, that it came again from, from a 
displeasure with the local priest, a man called Ulander. Uh, he seems to have been in very low esteem with the local uh, farmers on the island. According to one rumor, he had uh, robbed a, a wreck, a shipwreck, and blamed the farmers for it afterwards, which ended up in the trouble with, uh, with the local authorities. He also refused to teach local children and to give communion to everyone, and uh, there seems to be bad blood uh, involved. When the, when the priest's house burnt down in 1865, things got even worse. The, the farmers refused resolutely to build it up again for their, uh, uh, by, uh, and paying for it themselves. If it was going to be rebuilt, they wanted uh, the Lutheran church to pay for it, not themselves, and to get rid of this man. Uh, when that didn't work out, they uh, sought out the Orthodox church and told them that they were willing to, to convert. What happened was uh, that the Orthodox Church agreed to it. Uh, then the Runa peasants told them, oh, by the way, we have to go seal hunting now over the winter. Come back in spring. When spring came, the Lutheran priest had left the island, and suddenly the Runa peasants had no interest whatsoever in, uh, in converting. And Olaf is writing about how he was walking around on the island, and no one wanted to talk to him any longer. Everyone tried to avoid him. And uh, basically, some of them told him that this, they had gotten what they wanted anyway, and they couldn't see any reason to, to, to go along with this uncertainty now that they'd gotten rid of the, of the priest they wanted to get rid of. So it was an undoubtedly, in the case of the Runa peasants, first of all, it was very practical reasons why they were considering converting, but they also as a community united in this, first uh, in, in, in accepting conversion and then reneging on it. Uh, and that is, of course, very different from what happened on Ulmse, where there is no doubt that there was a, a sense of, of, of break that led to the conversion. Previously, there had been a unity in fighting the, the, the Stackelberg family, the la local barons. There was a unity among them in uh, they had to stand together to go to court, to do civil disobedience and so forth. And Österblom, by allying with Stackelberg and then getting a revivalist movement of people following him, had broken what was in many ways some kind of social contract among them. Uh, and in that way changed the power structures forever on the island. And there's no doubt that the Orthodox, the ones that converted to Orthodoxy, were probably considering that this would put them in good stead with the Russian authorities. That's also what happened. Stuckelberg died a year after uh, the conversion effort. Two years after his death, the Russian state bought up the entire island from his widow and let the farmers start paying off to buy their own farms back from the state. In 1905, the farmers sent a thank you message to the Russian Tsar for having bought uh, the, the state for them. And as a thank you, he gave them, uh, uh, he gave the farms to them, to the farmers basically. They didn't have to pay it off any longer. He wrote off the loans. And uh, that is was seminal in, in the economic flowering that happened on the island uh, it, in the time that followed. They grew richer as independent farmers afterwards. They were relatively wealthy compared to the local surroundings until they had to flee along with the rest of the Estonian Swedes to Ibo during the Second World War. The revivalist movement that Turin and Österbrom started, had spread to the Estonian communities around the Swedish speakers. And it was the start of, of, of many revivalist waves that has uh, continued to this day. Oh. On the picture here, picture here, we see uh, the Orthodox Church on Olmsø as it looks now. 
it's a ruin. It has not been used for over 60 years uh, for Orthodox services. Uh, after the, the ban against, re against converting away from Orthodoxy was removed around the First World War, most of the Orthodox peasants on the island rejoined Lutheranism. There was only a handful left afterwards, and the Orthodox priest left uh, soon after. Uh, for some concluding remarks. Uh, for most of its existence, the community of Olms uh, Swedes were a homogeneous society of tenant farmers. Their con conditions changed little up until the arrival of the Swedish missionaries in 1873, but then it changed rapidly. The changes cannot be seen merely as caused by the missionaries, it was also caused by the reactions of the locals and the Russian state. And now, uh, we've been thinking a bit, uh, James and I, on, on what does this all mean? Uh, and some preliminary questions is raised here by me. Uh, given their poverty and despair, why do we generally judge the Orthodox converts harsher than the born-again revivalists? Uh, and I'm talking then both about the Swedish historical literature on this, but also as as a Nordic people, uh, Nordic person reacting to this is almost, there is a certain sectarian logic built into our core reaction to something like that. Seeing a conversion to orthodoxy as, as an okay thing to handle life around you. Uh, which of course n makes more sense when you look at the conditions they lived under and also look at what did it mean to be Orthodox and what did it mean to be Lutheran at the time, uh, which for a peasant wouldn't make much of a difference. Uh, that is at least uh, my reflections on that uh, as of now. And also there is a, a distinct change in a community structure between the Runer example of 1866 and the Ormser example of 1886 has been a uh, hollowing out maybe of, of a bond of community as the core social unit and more individualism in Olimsö in 1886. And what we've been wondering is maybe you can see this revivalist movement as starting the individualization of faith in some case. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, for listening, for watching my uh, presentation. And I do hope you'll visit uh, uh, James, Dr. James White's website, balticorthodoxy.com. You can also contact us both through the contact page on that web, uh, uh, website. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you to you all, and I hope you have some questions. Okay, thank you, Trond. Uh, it seems that we don't have any questions, hmm. but if someone has any questions, feel free to reach out in the chat right now. We will wait for a couple of minutes maybe, hmm. or maybe not that long. So in the meantime, we would like to thank you and give you this gift bag safely oh. from distance. Yeah. Uh, to keep social distancing here. Okay, uh, so thank you. it seems that we got our first question. Yeah. Just going to. Yes. Okay, so it's more of a thank you. Oh, can you see the question? Um, no, I can, yes, yes. Yeah, about the relationship between the Estonians and the Estonian Swedes uh, mm -hmm. first. Uh, I would say that it's based on, on, on everything we see. It was very, it's quite a good relationship. It was nothing like the problematic relationship t you see between the Baltic Germans and the Estonians and the Russians and the Estonians. And there's, it's maybe not that difficult to understand, given that they lived under very similar circumstances. At least in the, in the middle of the 1800s, there was very di little different I difference in, 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 in living conditions, in rights and so forth. If anything, there was a much 
higher degree of rich Estonian farmers at this point than Swedish uh, speaking farmers that had become rich at this point. So, so we have another question from email. Pirat. Mm -hmm. Estonian court documents uh, in your research. Uh, that is uh, a question that James should probably answer. Uh, I do know that uh, he has looked at, uh, at, at you know, the, uh, the Russian provincial court documents. It's all in Russian or German, basically, we're looking at now. We're still in the early phases, and I don't, at this point, have an answer to that question. So we have a question from Vincent here. Mm -hmm. oh, the, do you think the theology of Swedish Protestantism had an impact on the work ethic on the island? Uh, and of course, you're getting into uh, Weber, uh, Max Weber's theory of Protestant ethics. Uh, I would. Sp this has been discussed in 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 the Swedish. Uh, history literature and it's definitely divided uh, the ones that tend to take as Blom uh, serious and he him as the primary source see exactly this that there was a Swedish Protestant work ethic that was brought to the island others have questioned that and said that there is no evidence that they were working less before they were just very fond of stealing from the barons because they didn't see uh, what they had to pay to the baron as legitimate. It was theft, so they were stealing it back, basically. But uh, what uh, true story is there? It's difficult to prove based on the source material. And uh, uh, then Tetso again. How might we find the images you showed in the presentation? They are from several sources, but most of them are from the book series called A Book on Estland Svenskar. It's in Swedish. It's uh, the local history of the Ibo people uh, produced by uh, the Swedish society that is now the uh, kind of community headquarters of the former Estonian Swedes. It's called Svenska Odlingen Svennar. And they've given out this uh, four volume work. It's four, uh, four volumes of five uh, on, on the local history of the, of the community with a lot of pictures like this, interesting pictures. We have another question from email. Just going to paste mm -hmm. it in. If we would visit these islands today, would we still see some evidence of Swedish, her Swedish heritage there? Uh, definitely. Uh, First of all, I think a lot of these islands, especially Olmsö, is quite proud of their Swedish heritage. Uh, so I think in Olmsö, they actually, on Nuarod, they have a Swedish museum, or is it in Hapsalo? And they have saved, like uh, on Olmsö, they have renovated Österblom's house. They have uh, quite a lot of different things to celebrate the, the, the Swedish heritage. And also a lot of these former uh, Swedish-speaking inhabitants have close contacts with these areas. Uh, some of them bought houses, they go back. Uh, so there's, uh, I would say, there's a little bit of a thriving community there. They're an exceptionally uh, active group of, uh, of, uh, of uh, former Ibo non people that are in interacting quite a lot with, with local communities in Western Estonia when it comes to the, to the Ibo heritage. Okay, there is another question from Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand a lot of Estonians fled to Riga looking to convert to Orthodoxy in the 1800s. Can you describe the confused state of Estonians and the reaction of Russian state? This is definitely a question for Dr. James White, not to me. Uh, you could try sending him a question on the contact uh, uh, Form we put up. Is it still visible for them? BalticOrthodoxy.com? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but it uh, sounds like an interesting question. So. 
Okay, we have another one from so Mama Trade. Mm -hmm. Did the Estonian Swedes have contact network between the different islands and coastal areas where they were living? They definitely did. Uh, there's no doubt about them. Uh, as I said, a lot of them were fishermen. Uh, so they had uh, small boats they rode around. There was quite a lot of contact, not only with, with the local surrounding area, with the coast and, and, and Estonian-speaking islands and so forth, but also over to Finland, where a lot of them were working, especially after uh, the First World War. There was quite a lot of contact, but also before that, quite a lot of contact, both to Finland, uh, but also with the local communities. And as I said, uh, and I should have mentioned when it came to the to the relationship with the Estonians, that the, is the, the, the sources seem to, say, seem to point to that virtually all the, the, the Aibo people spoke Estonian too, and they would often, when they met other Aibo people from, from, from different parts, from different islands, it would be easier for them to speak Estonian to them than to understand each other's dialects which points, points to quite a lot of, of, of social contact outside of their islands. Yeah. Okay, seems that we don't have any more questions. So, yep. So, thanks again, Karl. Yeah, and thank you to you, Rasmus, and For to every, all the good questions. That was, uh, that was enjoyable. Uh, yes, and thanks for everyone who tuned in. Uh, this is our first lecture in this online series. We will probably make more. So if you want to <coughs> stay uh, in the loop about future events, you can subscribe to our new email newsletter at vemu.ca. You can follow us also on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So thanks for tuning in and stay safe. Good night.